make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> it's a documentary short that centers the voices of survivors of abuse in evangelical spaces and lets them tell their story. And the survivors in this film are not just incredible and resilient women, but they also have a profound understanding of the context of, of you know, that they've developed over time, uh, not just of what facilitated the abuse, but also what led to their own faith communities, siding with their abusers, and marginalizing them and essentially blaming them for their own abuse. And so they can articulate that so powerfully. So the film centers those voices and it also frames the story in a wider political context, in the context of Christian nationalism. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, I'm your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing great. Thanks, Will. Hey, and today we are so glad to have back with us Kristen Cobus Dume, who is a professor of history at Calvin University and a renowned author, scholar, whose work focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics, and is best known for her New York Times bestselling book, Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Crypted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. And today, we're going to be discussing her involvement with the powerful documentary For Our Daughters, which explores the impact of patriarchy and women, particularly within religious communities and what it means for future generations. So welcome back to the show, Kristen. Thank you. It's so good to be back with you. <laughs> it yes. really is. Uh, I, I remember the the first time we talked, I called you a superwoman. And <laughs> and, I, and I'm wondering if if um, you feel that label still applies, because I, I do personally. Yes. Oh, did I did I feel it applied back then? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> you but were, no, things you... have only escalated since we last <laughs> talked. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, because um, I mean, you, you were you were pretty humble. I mean, just like you are you are now, and it, it's funny because um, yeah, things have escalated quite a bit. And and I I was talking to Matthew Taylor recently, and and I was like, Matthew, I'm sure when you got into this field, you did not think you were going to be doing like PBS, MSNBC hits, you know, like, yes. and he's like. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad to have Matthew joining us on the front lines right now. He, absolutely. Oh, I thought you got into this to get famous, uh, Kristen. <laughs> you know, honestly, became a professor at Calvin. Honestly, this is that is uh, it, it sounds it sounds I don't know annoying maybe to say it, but that is the hardest thing about this work. It's it's not like the critics you know, taking their swings, which is its own whole thing. It's, it's, I'm just not really wired for this level of public exposure. Mm. And, uh, yeah, this is kind of what the moment requires. And so it's really stretching me and <laughs> I just find myself mm. longing for, you know, a whole day of, um, nobody talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> just writing. I think everyone on the call understands that idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, we definitely appreciate all the all the great work you're doing and love reading your your stuff, your Substack and all that. And loved watching your um, documentary that you came out with. So for our daughters and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to have you explain it. Um, kind of what it's all about here in a second. But but I just have to say I watched it. It's free on YouTube, by the way. Um, and it was frustrating. It was uh, sad. It was hard to watch, but it was also inspiring um, because of the yes. the strength the women had to just come forth. So, so with that sort of in the background, like what is for our daughters? I'm so glad uh, that's how you feel after watching it because that's how I felt in uh, in being in the room with the survivors who were telling their stories. So For Our Daughters is a 30-minute film. It's a documentary short that centers the voices of survivors of abuse in evangelical spaces and lets them tell their story. And the survivors in this film 
are not just incredible and resilient women, but they also have a profound understanding of the context of, of you know, that they've developed over time, uh, not just of what facilitated the abuse, but also what led to their own faith communities, siding with their abusers and marginalizing them and essentially blaming them for their own abuse. And so they can articulate that so powerfully. So the film centers those voices and it also frames the story in a wider political context, in the context of Christian nationalism, because the very same pastors who are promoting this hierarchical ideal, this rigid patriarchy that demands that women submit sexually and socially and theologically, um, some of these very same figures are now pressing for a Christian nationalist takeover of the government. The networks are there. We we can track them. We didn't get into that in this film because of the, the length, um, but it's all there. And so we thought this is an important moment, not just to speak to people inside the church, although absolutely that, but also to speak to a wider audience and to let women who have lived under the the kind of harshest aspects of this patriarchal system of control to speak to all women, all Americans. Man, that's really powerful. And I got to just second what Will said, because I was brokenhearted and I have two daughters of my own and I'm imagining them in that situation and then a church uh, giving a standing ovation to, you know, someone who is their abuser and how much, uh, you know, not because of the abuse, but the idea of the repentance. And but even that right there, there, there's not this sense of real accountability and everyone's like celebrating this person who's coming because they got caught. Right. And uh, and and confessing, quote unquote, and then everyone's celebrating it. And those are some of those heartbreaking scenes and the whole uh, thing for me. And imagining my daughters in that situation is just gut wrenching. And it was challenging to watch. My guess is it was challenging to make. And I would love for you to kind of dig into some of the challenging, maybe even surprising aspects of this film as you were producing, writing, making it, like what was that process and experience like for you? Yeah, it was, uh, there were a lot of kind of unexpected aspects. First of all, I went into this kind of blindly. The director, Carl Biker, approached me and he wanted to do a project in connection with Jesus and John Wayne. And as a writer, I can say that for me, uh, making a movie was nowhere on my bucket list. So I was a little uh, hesitant, but he, I really liked his work. And he seemed to have a really good understanding. So I thought, well, you know, why not? Do I have a reason to say no? Little did I know, you know, what I was really signing up for, that we were, we've were we been working on this for more than a year, you know, multiple shoots. And because of the sensitive nature of this uh, subject, too, uh, you know, it, it was an investment in, this isn't just where the filmmaker could go and, and you know, bring a team and, and do the work. It was important to both of us to, um, make sure that we handled survivors' stories well. And a lot of times this doesn't happen, that their stories are kind of taken from them um, and that they're used. And so, um, you know, we we talked a lot and, and read a lot of how to do that well and kept open communication. And one of the things that we did is um, I asked all of the questions um, in the interviews uh, I, I had those conversations and, um, and, and so that meant a lot of travel and, you know, filming. And I learned a lot about the, how documentary films work and, and they're very fluid. That was the other thing. Uh, you don't really know, you just start getting footage and are we going to do this yeah. with it? Are we going to do that? <laughs> we'll have to see, you know, what, where's the funding going to come from and distribution and all of these things kept, it changed so many times over the course of the, um, the film, uh, the other thing I would say that it's easier being a writer, I think, because um, there are so many amazing quotes out there that we can just pull and put in our books. But to have them in a film, you got to have it on camera. 
right? So there's a ton of, you know, very incriminating quotes that we could have used, um, but we are kind of limited with, we needed high quality video production. And so thankfully, some of these pastors uh, who were perfect candidates have high quality video production for their podcasts. And so, you know, gratitude in that direction. Yes. But, um, you know, there was just a lot of different aspects uh, to making a film rather than, you know, what I'm used to, which is just opening books and pulling out quotes and putting it into my own text and calling it good. That That's uh, that's really kind of interesting and funny, like just uh, peeling back the banana and, and realizing that, wow, this is like this is a lot of work, but, but, but I imagined, I'd, I'd imagine you're, you're, you, you were probably driven. I mean, it was a lot of work, but, and you're like, Oh my gosh, I don't really want to do that again, but I'm glad I did it. Yeah, you know, exactly. sort, sort, of, sort of thing. Uh, can you, can you tell us about the women that were featured in the, in the film? Oh, I would love to. Um, so it, the film opens with Kate West and, uh, she's the author of the book Rift and she has a really interesting story. And because of length, we, we weren't able to tell her full story, but she was growing up in a pretty normal, uh, Christian home until her dad came under the influence of Doug Wilson's teachings. And he ends up pulling the kids out of school and there moves the family and isolates the family. And she's raised as a stay at home daughter. And, uh, you know, much of the last several years has been her trying to extricate herself from that world and and create a new life going forward. And she has just such an exquisite understanding of the dynamics inside those spaces. Um, So that's Kate. And then we have um, prominent survivors in SBC spaces. Krista Brown, who is, I think, a familiar name to many people who follow these stories, has done so much, has been in this space for decades. Jules Woodson and Tiffany Thigpen as well. And um, both of those have also had very public roles in working to bring reform, exposure and reform inside the SBC. And then Rachel Den Hollander as well, speaking as an extremely knowledgeable survivor advocate. And um, one of the things that was really important to me when I selected um, participants for this film was to only ask people who were already public on their own terms. And especially in the case of sex abuse, because uh, I've been working in this area for a while now, you know, just as a writer, as a historian. And when you do that, other women come to you with their stories. And I've already, since this film released just less than a week ago, I've already heard so many more stories from women who say, you know, this happened to me too. I didn't want to take any of those stories and then put them on this public stage because I know what happens to survivors who speak out. They are treated viciously by Mm. powerful people and institutions who are trying to cover this up and discredit them and smear them and make this all go away. And I've watched that happen with horror. And so one of the things that was actually really important to me was to make absolutely certain that every participant knew what she was, what she was stepping into. And they all knew because they've lived it. And they're all just incredibly brave to go on camera and to say their stories, knowing the blowback that's likely to come. How, how did you go about, um, I guess, finding these these women or, or were they people already kind of in your circle that that you knew knew part of their story and you reached out to them? Yeah, I um, so first I several of them are in Jesus and John Wayne, the last chapter of the book. Um, and I did not set out to write a book about abuse. It was not on my radar when I started researching evangelical masculinity and militarism back in the early 2000s. Uh, But what I saw over time was that uh, one after another of the pastors that I had been writing about who were preaching this really militant conception of Christian manhood became implicated in abuse scandals, either as perpetrators of abuse, abuse of power, sexual abuse, or often defending their friends who were the perpetrators. And so I was just taking notes. And when I decided to actually write the book, which was in the fall of 2016, in the aftermath of the Access Hollywood uh, uh, tapes being released, Uh, When everyone was saying, you know, oh, surely, surely evangelicals can't possibly support this man now that he's on camera, you know, um, admitting to bragging to assaulting women. Um, And and we all know what happened there. Um, You know, I, I thought right then, no, no, no. 
they've done this before. We've seen this before so often in their own churches, in their own institutions. And that's when this kind of clicked for me. And actually one of the first things I did when I thought I need to, I need to do this, I need to write this book. I knew that these stories had to be in there, but this was before me too happened. Uh, before Church 2 happened, when I first started writing what became Jesus and John Wayne. And so one of the first things I did was consult a lawyer. Um, Just a big picture, like, can I even use these stories? Because I had been already following them on blogs, survivor blogs, sometimes in um, kind of local or regional newspapers would give a little bit of coverage. And then while I was working on the book, uh, Me Too happened and the Church Too movement happened and the national media started picking up these stories, which was really helpful for me because it reduced my own liability. The stories were out there. They were vetted. But if you had been paying attention before, right, these stories were nothing new. And I think that's important. Um, people just weren't paying attention or they decided to look the other way. The stories were all out there. So these women, most of them were in in the book already. And, uh, and then in ensuing years, since the book has come out, I've been watching these spaces. And in the case of Kate, uh, I actually got her manuscript, um, early on in the game, um, long before the book, uh, she wrote her, her, before her memoir published. And I just saw how well she could articulate that. So she was kind of on my radar as well. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting to hear about that. You know, as, as I was watching the film, there's one, there's several scenes that really impacted me, but one that was standing out to me is this guy, and I've forgotten his name, uh, but he was he was uh, one of the podcasters uh, or Joel you know, Levin, pastors. maybe, maybe, but he was basically like, I control, yeah, Joel. you know, yeah, the four people in my life. You know, there's four people I control. I tell them when to go to the bathroom, and uh, I'm just like. You know, I let my dog out to go to the bathroom. I kind of control my dog, you know, when my dog eats and when my dog goes to the bathroom. It's like it sounds like you're talking about animals and not people when you talk that way and dehumanizing. And I I would love for you to kind of dig in and help us understand, you know, you've talked about this at length in your book. You've addressed some of these issues in your writing. But how did we get here where there are people saying these things in 2024 and it's totally you know it's felt totally acceptable and i'm i'm all for freedom of speech i'm but this is like people are yeah it seems to go beyond that in some way and i'm not totally sure like this isn't a this is a new thought so it's not like it's a wealth uh process thought but it's like, what is going on that there's this movement that dads would do this, that people would, you know, be a part of this? What kind of help us understand the broader theological and maybe even if you can, sociological themes going on here? I'm glad you brought that up. And first of all, there's a, a small error in the film in terms of labeling that got um, worked its way in at the very last minute that I did not catch. And that is uh, that the label of that person's name. I think it, it was stated as Josh Webin. It's Joel Webin. Uh, anybody who's in the uh, Twitter space knows Joel quite well. Um, and uh, so the reason that that got uh, the label is dropped is kind of at the last minute I was looking at the film and right at that quote where you're talking about where you said, I control my... Um, um, you know, there's four people who, who's, who, who I have total control over, you know, wife and kids. Uh, we had had a picture of him standing there with his wife and children that he posts publicly. And, um, when I first saw that in an earlier cut, I said, you got to blur their faces, right? I really don't want that. And then very late in the game, watch it again. And I'm like, could we just take them out all together? I just, I don't want to, I just want to protect that family. I want to protect the wife and kids and, and not, not pull them into the space if they didn't bring themselves into the space. And so it was a last minute swap. And then when the labels were put back on there, that error got in. So I just, uh, uh, new, new uh, editions of the film have that corrected, but um, that's Joel. How did this happen? When I was writing Jesus and John Wayne, I came across some really shocking teachings about women from people like Doug Wilson, who also features in this film. Um, again, high video production quality there uh, in Moscow. And um, and I, 
it, things like, uh, uh, you know, about race, about gender, about patriarchy, about control of women, demeaning comments about women. And uh, also, you know, even as we have in the film, another women quote that no, women shouldn't have the vote. We should go back to the household vote. And, and I include a, an example of that, not from Webin, but from another figure um, in Jesus and John Wayne. And I really debated whether I should put that in because I'm like, I, I don't run into this in my circles. Come on. Yeah, th- this is too extreme. Um, I, so it's probably just really an outlier. And I came across it again and again, and I, I kind of looked at it and I thought, this is actually the logical outcome of this kind of male headship that they are promoting and a male headship that, that other Christians, more modern Christians also are promoting, or at least what I was seeing was a failure to distinguish among more moderate conservatives, including many complementarians to distinguish their understanding of patriarchy or of masculine authority from these more extreme uh, agents. And that's one of the themes of Jesus and John Wayne. What is mainstream and what is fringe? And one of the arguments that I make is that the fringe is moving into the mainstream. And Doug Wilson in the book is the prime example of this, not the only one, but the prime example. So in the 1990s, he's undeniably marginal fringe and he loves being on the edges takes pride in it. And then you see over the course of the 2000s, uh, he's platformed by Christianity today. John Piper has his back, right? He starts moving into these spaces and becomes mainstream. Now we're in the next chapter. And what we're seeing now is what the institutions and organizations that we used to think were mainstream, Christianity Today, um, National Association of Evangelicals, even to a certain extent, the Gospel Coalition, they are taking some serious hits from their right wing, the flank. And, and they're, uh, so the, this extremist, this fringe group. So now the power dynamics keep shifting. And now you've got men like Doug Wilson playing a, a disturbingly prominent role in these kind of new coalitions, Christian nationalist coalitions that have been coming together. And I've watched them come together over the past years, even the last months, you just keep seeing these these coalitions building. So now we have connections between some of these fringe figures and podcasters with um, contributors to Project 2025, direct links to the former Trump administration, to those who hope to be part of the future Trump administration, to J.D. Vance, to the NatCon movement, right? You have all of these, it's a whole web. And so it's actually quite frightening because now you have these fringe voices who have been um, flourishing in small spaces and isolated spaces, now seeing that they may well be poised to grasp power nationally and that they can then bring these teachings into the nation as a whole, into our legal system. And this is what they're talking about when they're talking about Christian America. Man, like that is disturbing yes. to think about, you know, because I had the same kind of shock that uh, you originally described. Yeah. Like, is this for real? Like, yeah. is this really something people are thinking? And and I have felt that way more than I care to recall at this point in the last few years. Like, wait, what? Is this really what people are thinking? Is this really what my fellow Pentecostals are saying? Is this really what is happening? I mean, I grew up Pentecostal and I'm like, I don't remember hearing this kind of stuff. But again, I grew up in Northern Virginia, near Washington, D.C., very progressive place. Even the conservative were likely very progressive, although that's not all of them, right? Uh, I can't paint with a broad brush. But I'm just shocked and continue to be shocked, even though it's I'm getting numb to it, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, just with the stuff I'm I'm hearing. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about Doug Wilson and maybe even use Doug Wilson as that kind of test case example 
for how this has moved from marginal to mainstream. Because you mentioned like Christianity Today, and we've had the editor in chief, um, you know, uh, Russell Moore on. It seems like Christianity Today is definitely taking a different direction. Oh, yeah. Um, in my, in my, you know, estimation of what I've seen now, which I'm, I'm thankful for, especially in light of these conversations. But help us understand like what, like using Doug Wilson, who he is, and, and kind of how this has moved marginal to mainstream how has it been that these they've been picked up how, how can people justify this and and uh basically be okay with it these major names yeah yeah so doug wilson is a very cantankerous uh pastor and i i use that word i you know i think i think he would approve of that wholeheartedly uh he um uh, uh, so what that meant was he was kind of charting his own course he was not um, tightly networked when he started off as a pastor. I mean, he was so cantankerous, he couldn't find his way into a denomination. And so he starts his own church and then he starts his own school. And um, and he he moves to Moscow, Idaho to do this. And he, um, it, which is a, a kind of enclave then, um, just the right size city where he can um, make a difference, really. So it, it's an enclave mentality, but not just inwardly focused. The goal is always to transform society. He wasn't poised to transform the nation, but he could. He set his sights on Moscow, Idaho, and um, from there, then he builds this growing network that, uh, particularly through homeschooling, and um, many in the homeschool world use curriculum uh, that he develops. He starts up a publishing house, Canon Press, and he produces his own, you know, media content, podcasts, and um, oh, at first it was this kind of magazine, and um, and and that has a. Uh, 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 oh, and let me also say, and he was influenced deeply by Rush Dooney. Um, and Rush Dooney is one of these figures where you know right away you say the name Rush Dooney, oh, you're talking fringe, right? That doesn't apply to you know normal evangelicals. Uh, I'm going to say that, um, and here historians have not go- done a, a good job either. Rush Dooney is far more influential throughout quote unquote mainstream evangelicalism than most people realize, and then that than most pe- uh, historians have acknowledged. Rush Dooney, very rigid ideas of hierarchy, of authority and submission, and um, is extremely patriarchal, and you know everybody is in a chain of command. And God is at the top and then, you know, the pastor and men, and then you're, you have to obey the authority God places above you as though you are obeying God, right? It's just cut and dried. Um, Rush Dooney is also extremely racist and um, Wilson picks that up and there are, you know, all sorts of these things, but this idea of order and hierarchy. And so Wilson takes these ideas and spreads them through conservative networks into other isolated communities um, and these homeschool circles. And it just kind of builds from there. And then in the 1990s, you have uh, the homeschool movement itself really starting to expand with the support of mainstream evangelicals like James Dobson really start promoting homeschool. And then everybody who's doing homeschool is getting this curriculum or related um, uh, curricula from um, folks usually influenced by Rush Dooney. So you have that growing. And then um, what happens is that by the early 2000s, with the Young Restless Reformed movement and with the kind of turn towards militancy that I traced uh, in Jesus and John Wayne in the post 9-11 era, suddenly these really militant preachers have a wider resonance. Uh, Every man has a battle to fight, right? That's the John Eldridge. That just really takes hold in that historical and political moment. And so somebody like Doug Wilson was made for that moment. And he steps in and you see these new alliances form where before, you know, the certain theological um, differences that these guys had would have, you know, made any cooperation impossible. They set deep theological differences aside in order to unite around patriarchy, around patriarchal power and a conservative kind of political agenda. 
And that's really, we're living with the effects now. And it has just gotten, they have consolidated that power. And the more power they have, the more extreme they can become. So now what's Doug Wilson up to? You know, his book, Canon Press, published one of the key works on Christian nationalism, Stephen Wolf's Case for Christian Nationalism. Doug Wilson is popping up on Tucker Carlson now. Um, he, right, he's he's playing he's kind of like playing the the grandfather role or maybe the godfather role of this this um, uh, emerging Christian national nationalist network that if as a historian I know its roots go back to Rush Dooney and that resonates with I mean we could try trace more roots uh, through you know Pentecostal and and the NAR we talked about Matthew Taylor's work and you can see Rush Dooney's impact there as well so what we have now is across American evangelicalism this um, uh, widespread acceptance and promotion of a very rigid idea of how our society should be structured and a very rigid idea of women's role and that is to submit. You know, I'm curious with the, with the Me Too movement, you know, there is this barrage of survivors coming, you know, stepping forward. You know, you're seeing folks like, you know, Harvey Weinstein and all these other folks that are, that are being, you know, held, held to, to justice because of the things that they've, they've done. Um, was there a similar movement within churches that, that sort of mirrored kind of at least like the, the public facing, you know, comments that survivors have, um, have mentioned? Yeah. Yeah, um, there there was, and it was uh, the Me Too movement that inspired many evangelical women to say, "Okay, I'm going to speak out now too. I've carried this story." You know, Jules Woodson in the film talks directly about that. It's you know, we've had Me Too, and 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 it was it was it was in the midst of the Me Too movement that she sent her abuser pastor an email saying, "Remember what happened? I do right," and and then has the courage to expose that um, publicly. And because he's pastoring another church, and this happens over and over again, this, this uh, there has been no reckoning. So the Me Too movement helped prompt, um, uh, you know, the, the, a similar movement in the church, and uh, and then for a brief period of time, a year or so, there was a sense of hope because so many stories were coming out, and there is a thought of surely, surely, when evangelical Christians hear about this injustice, when evangelical Christians who so value sexual purity and truth and doing what's right, right, they are going to tackle this problem in their own houses because, um, you know, why wouldn't you? And this abuse is being perpetuated in the name of Christ. So if you care about the witness of the church, you will want to expunge this, right, from the body of Christ. That's not what happened, right? And it, even inside the SBC, where, where we have kind of the most prominent case of you know, the survivors, of Jules and Tiffany and, and, and Krista, all come from inside that space. And we've watched it play out. And Rachel Den Hollander has tried to help the SBC bring reform uh, into their, to bring transparency, accountability, to being, bring better teachings, better practices. And she has been stonewalled over and over again, and not just stonewalled, but ruthlessly attacked by people with power inside the SBC and the Conservative Baptist Network. And we have just seen that play out. And where are we a couple years out now from the um, the Houston Chronicle? Actually, like five years out, I think, four or five years out from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, really, it, no better. In fact, worse in some ways, because what we've lost is the hope that when people see this, they will want to do what is right. And so it's actually incredibly discouraging and it, it you know, more is needed, more exposure. But what we really need is uh, the bystanders to step into the game here. The bystanders, like the people who are members of these communities, of faith communities, who are members of denominations. They need to pay attention and they need to put a little skin in the game too uh, because survivors and advocates are getting ruthlessly attacked. And, and let me say that, you know, the, the stories in this film have been thoroughly vetted, you know, first in terms of the, the media and then again for the film. 
like legal review, meticulous analysis, documentation, verifying every claim. They are speaking truth. Right? And, and we have to, as members of faith communities, we have to take their stories to heart and we have to look again at our own communities, our own spaces. And we have to, we have to take a side here because if we don't, this will continue to happen. And these patterns will continue over and over again because they have been going on for decades now. <laughs> I'm wondering if, if, if there is a, is there a difference between kind of the external, I don't know, pressures that a churchgoer might have to, to think about or consider versus, you know, somebody at a secular business coming forward? Because I, I know for, for myself, like a lot of the church communities and churches that I've, I've been a part of, and Josh is one of them, I, I go to his church, so he's, he's a pretty good guy, I guess. And uh, um, like your church communities become your family. You know, and yes. versus like like a coworker, you know. So yeah. like if I if I go and you know expose my boss and say my boss is doing this thing and that thing or whatever, like I may be out of a job, you know, I might get ridiculed, whatever. But it's like, eh, you know, like like it won't be as impactful as man these people who invite me over for cookouts every weekend, you know. That yeah. all of a sudden, like, so so I'm curious if you can maybe talk about some of those external factors. Oh, yeah. Enormous pressures, both, you know, for survivors who come forward and who, you know, many have been taught that, you know, to do so is to undercut the the witness of the church and to undercut this, you know, the, the ministry of this man of God. So first of all, you know, even to go forward. And then there are enormous pressures from within the community to circle the wagons and to protect that man of God. And to make the problem go away. And and then there's the effects of that on the victim and the victim's family, right? Because you think, oh, this is terrible. We're bringing it now to the pastor. We're bringing it to the elders. Their job is to take care of the church and to take care of us, right? Surely they're going to do this. And then when they don't, it's this sense of absolute betrayal and just bewilderment. And you know, when I was researching Jesus and John Wayne, I came across a number of stories and then my conversations with survivors since um, where they say, you know, what happened to me was terrible. Like the actual sex abuse was terrible. But what was actually worse was the response of my church, of the people that I thought cared about me, the people whom I cared about, the people that I, you know, spent every Wednesday night with and Saturday and then youth group and twice on Sundays. And like, these were my families and evan my family and evangelicalism really thrives on that, right? They invite people in, give them a sense of belonging and, and, and essentially pro provide them with a, a, a complete package deal, you know, where your spiritual life and where your social life. And, you know, yes, your kids don't need a social life in high school because they've got youth groups so you can protect them from the outside world and just bring them here all the time. So they, they provided that entire kind of bubble. And so for people inside that bubble to have that, those people fail them and then even demonize them, blame them, it is, it, it wrecks them. And so many survivors, understandably, leave those spaces and leave the faith entirely. And I do not blame them for that one bit. It is absolutely brutal and it's so disappointing. And then we have to look at the complicity here. You're going to have predators in any system and maybe even especially in, in churches, right? Soft targets. But what about the bystanders? What about the rest of us? How are we going to respond when these stories come to light? And that's where the church has failed miserably. And there are reasons for that. And we have to tackle that. Yeah, I would love to dig into the reasons why we, the church has failed in this. I would love to dig into that a little bit more because I guess there's some things that are rolling around in my mind. If I can just give a little bit of context, like, you know, like what Will said, you have this community that feels like family that kind of, 
you know, and, and I think should feel like family. I mean, I think the church should be a place where people can connect and people can have, form deep relationships. And so you have this biblical kind of precedent of fellowship and koinonia and this idea that which that's the Greek word for like fellowship. It's even deeper than that, right? The sharing of life together. And you have things like Paul will say in First Corinthians 6, say, guys, stop taking your lawsuits among non-believers, right? You're bringing this. And I'm sure that that scripture, <laughs> right, is used and abused. So or you have harm. Matthew 18, yes. where it's like, hey, if you have an offense, you go to that person and then you take it. And so the concentric circle of spread, yes. right? And so you have these kinds of biblical precedents, which of course, those are scriptures we do need to figure it out as Christians and disciples of Christ. What do those apply? How do they apply today? And yet, of course, you can see just from a cursory look at them that they are uh, ripe for abuse, if in the wrong hands. So talk to us a little bit about that. Maybe even how have these scriptures been used and what is the proper way and I'm not trying to tell you to go through some big exegesis of it all, but just in your thoughts and your and your study and what you've done, what is the solution for us to stay faithful to the Bible and but bring accountability and not allow this kind of insulation to create situations where abuse is not only possible but really likely yeah. because of the lack of accountability? I love that question, and there's so many layers uh, to to answering it. Because I would add, I would add um, a little bit more even to the question. Uh, you, you know, Matthew 18, and um, um, you know, not going to secular authorities. Uh, so much harm. I'll add, do not gossip. Often used in these cases. So instead of transparency, bringing things to light, protecting people. Nope, nope, nope. You know, the the first thing. Uh, Tiffany's pastor asked her when she brought the story of abuse forward was, have you told anybody else? She said, no, I mean, bring it to you. Good. Keep it that way. Right? That just creates this, this um, uh, recipe for, for disaster and brings in all kinds of temptations too to people who are part of that system to like, keep it quiet, keep it quiet, cover it up. Well, it's not, you know, don't let it get out, expose it and then work through it. Um, but there are other theological underpinnings that we have to take into account as well that are problematic before we get to how we deal with this. And we have to talk about theology around gender and sexuality, um, not just the theology of women's submission. Um, and we could talk about complementarianism. That word is so unhelpful, I think, in, in many of these conversations because it means wildly different things to different people. And some people who espouse complementarian values do not, they live extremely egalitarian lives. So when they think, yeah, of course you can be complementarian and, you know, and uh, protect women and do all these things, you know, they're actually living in egalitarian relationships. But, you know, uh, Kind of giving lip service to complementarianism. For some people, complementarianism means you know women should not should not be preachers, should not ha be ordained um, in the ministry of the word. For others, it means um, women must submit to their husbands. For some, it means women must submit to all men in their lives. Um, and for for some, it means not just submit, but also there's this whole laundry list of roles. Uh, you know, John Piper's good at coming up with those. <laughs> like, so can she be a police officer? Let's think about it. And we probably not. Can can a can a woman give a man directions if he's lost? Well, isn't that teaching a man? Right. I mean, so what it, what are we even talking about here? Um, but we have to look at the that model of sub male power, male authority, and a woman's role to submit. And then what does that look like when we talk about sexuality? And here, Doug Wilson's great on this. Uh, he can articulate, you know, it is a man's job to um, colonize, to penetrate, right? It brings us right into the sexual uh, space. Uh, he, he loves that kind of thing. And um, and it is a woman's job to receive, right? To, to, <laughs> to, to be this kind of submissive recipient of male authority, um, you know, within the family, within the authority, and then also in the bedroom. Um, and 
what you have also that runs through and through these spaces is a theology of sexuality that says God made men and women to be completely other, completely opposite. Um, men are to be leaders and they're aggressive and, and God made them this way. God filled them with testosterone. So restraint is not really their thing. Boys will be boys. Uh, and this includes in the bedroom. And there, Jesus and John Wayne have all kinds of quotes from just dozens of books on this. Um, this. This is a standard teaching, right? You want your man to be a leader, don't you? God says he has to be. Well, he has to be a leader in the bedroom. And they're not good at restraining themselves. So it's so. what about purity? Where they're talking about sexual purity all the time. That's on the woman. So a woman who is not married has to be exceedingly careful never to tempt a man who is not her husband. And a woman who is married has to fulfill her husband's every sexual need. So you see where this goes. If there's a case of sexual misconduct, there is always a woman to blame. And I came across shocking, shocking stories where young girls were blamed for seducing their own fathers who were assaulting them. And women blamed when their husband assaulted their own children because she was not meeting their needs. This is abhorrent. And here too, when I came across these teachings, I thought this cannot be. But I came across them over and over and over again. And you will hear this kind of rhetoric. What was she wearing? What was she doing? Um, you know, clearly you have all the discourse that pops up all the time about the yoga pants and about modesty. And, you know, did uh, David didn't really rape Bathsheba and all of these things. This is a constant theme. It's pervasive. So what does that do when a woman is assaulted? She is, by virtue of her assault, guilty one way or another. And it, 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 I mean, this is, this is just underlying these conversations. And Rachel Den Hollander in the film is so good at articulating this. She has seen this too, right? And when she entered this all, you know, she was a complementarian homeschool mom and could see the harm that this kind of, if we want to call it complementarian teaching, was doing. So yeah, I'm not talking about telling people that they have to give up all their theological convictions or their interpretations of different passages of scripture. They have to see the fruit here. And then they have to look back and they have to look at all the passages of scripture that they are contradicting, running afoul of by allowing these systems to keep perpetuating this abuse and this cover up. And that's what I, I really think people have to do. And that's why these stories in the film so powerfully explain what this looks like in the lives of women, in the lives of, they, they, were, they were teenagers at the time. You know, I'm, I'm curious, how, how do we go from, you know, like an awareness that this stuff is actually happening um, to legitimate tangible actions where one we can empower these women to come forth but also you know balance all the things you said earlier about oh you know i gotta make sure i protect the witness of the church you know my friendships all this other kind of stuff so like how do how do you even do that mm. oh, uh, we have uh on uh, at fouradaughtersfilm.com we actually have a page of resources to, to answer these kinds of questions uh, and to put churches and individuals in touch with organizations who uh, specialize in this. So, you know, there's groups on there listed where you can, um, you know, have essentially an audit of your own church's practices. You know, do you have a, have safe church practices? I, you know, I just came a couple of weeks ago from my own, my own church training every year. Any one of us who do does anything with children has to fulfill this, you know, hour and a half course. And then we have lunch after it and it's, it's detailed and we have all kinds of practices that we implement. Things like the doors in our Sunday school rooms are locked when they're not in use. So you can't get in an isolated private space um, when you're not supposed to be in that space, right? These sorts of things. We have rules for if a little, you know, if one of the three-year-olds in children's church has to use the restroom. We have very, very clear policies to safeguard all spaces, all situations. Um, it's 
actually, you can do it. It's a bit of a pain to attend the, this, you know, the thing every year. And it's a real pain if you're leading three-year-olds because the rule there that our church uses is you actually have to take the entire class with you. <laughs> I'll go with oh, Awkward this for the three-year-old. Back, another one has to go. You know, that's just, you know, that's how you spend your time that day then, you know? And it's just treated with like, it, this is what we value. And and that sends a message, right, across the, 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 the church and the community. And you call things out and you say, that's not a great practice there, you, you know? Um, no, you don't drive alone with a kid from youth group like uh, Jules's youth pastor did with her and then um, assaulted her, right? You just don't, you don't do that. You never put yourself in that situation. You never put a child in that situation. Um, so, so there's, there's those sorts of um, uh, resources. There's resources for, for uh, women. And this is also men, boys are abused. We have resources for women and and men um, uh, who who realize, you know, what happened to them was not their fault or, or just now realizing it. Um, and, and we have, we recommend books by Diane Langberg, um, Rachel Dunhollander, Sheila Gregoire, who explain how the theology and the cultural practices contribute to this. And we need, so, so there's not like a, a one way, here's what you do. You need to do, you need to do all the work and all of us need to be doing this work so that we can build collectively different way of doing things, a different set of expectations, a different culture in our institutions and in our organizations. So we really have to have to do that and take that seriously and, you know, call out. So, so here's something I did, like totally kind of random thing. I called out a situation that wasn't that bad. I was visiting a church. Um, I was going to be speaking afterwards. Um, Oh, it was actually quite wild now that I think of it. It was the just, I was speaking on um, Jesus and John Wayne and on this chapter on sex abuse in particular is what they wanted. And it was just before the, um, um, uh, it, it ended up being the week of the, uh, the Sunday after the Brett Kavanaugh um, hearings. Oh my gosh. So it was, you know, center stage. But in that service, um, they had a guest pastor who actually was from the seminary um, affiliated with my university and lovely person, you know, it was all great. And um, uh, he was familiar with the people there. They knew him and he got up to preach and he said, um, I want everybody to take out your phones. Said, okay. Take out your phone. I want you to put this number into it. Like not telling us what, okay. And then now I want you to text. This is your pastor's number and give him a message and tell him just how amazing he is. Right. And how much you appreciate him. And they're like going on and and I was like, what kind of atmosphere does that set? The expectations for you to affirm, adore your pastor in this space, the manipulation there. Now I'm all for giving your pastor a pat on the back. And, you know, I try to go out of my way and appreciate my pastors, but I don't want to be coerced into that or even manipulated into that. And I don't want the expectation in my church to be that this is what we do in this space. Because guess what? Pastors can be predators. And, and so I actually wrote an email to this pastor, I, I guest pastor. I was like, do I do this? I was like, I was really uncomfortable. And what he did is, can we get on the phone? I would love to understand more because I didn't, I, I didn't see any harm in it. And we had a long conversation and he was deeply appreciative to his credit, he was not defensive, at least not on the phone. And, you know, I was as easygoing as I could be. I'm like, it just hit me wrong. And here's why. And we had a long talk. And I think he changed a little bit how he handles these situations. Again, this was not a situation of abuse. I have every reason to believe that pastor that we were all, you know, supposed Hmm. to pat on the back. Great guy. But what practices and expectations are we instilling in our communities? And, And we have to get this right. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> fascinating story. I'm trying to imagine yeah, how I would feel in that situation. I probably wouldn't put the number unless <laughs> I already had it and knew the guy. And then I might, you know, text him and say, hey, thanks I for everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're doing. <laughs> and then, but uh, it's so funny. I, I would love, and this, this is going to be my kind of last uh, big question, but I would love for you to kind of make a call 
to action, especially, and you just did, but maybe not a call to action as much as a call to understanding, especially with this connection with Trump. Um, you, you know, you put some of the, you know, the quote that he said, I'll be dictator for a day. And, uh, you know, these quotes of podcasters and, and leaders, influencers saying, you know, I'm trying to dismantle democracy. Uh, we need a, a Christian nation. We want uh, Christianity as the national religion. Like the guys up there is like, duh, of course we want that, you know, that kind of idea. And help us connect it to like how serious this is. We've talked about it, things moving from marginal to mainstream. We've talked about kind of the theological underpinnings, the insulation that makes abuse very likely, makes situations conducive to abuse. I would love to kind of even connect it in a broader sense, even more, make that more explicit as to the concern that you have and that you feel like others should have about how this isn't just some crazy people saying some stuff that we can ignore. Like, essentially, why can't we just ignore this and just say, hey, you know what? These guys are whatever. It's America. You can say what you want. I'm moving on. I'm thinking about something else. And why do we even have to make it political, right? <laughs> You're right, um, yeah. You know, of course, I, I came upon this topic studying gender and politics and and realized that these were part of the same problem. Uh, a, a dangerous conception of power and uh, dangerous, particularly when it's blended with Christian faith. Uh, because as I understand it, at the heart of the gospel teaching is, I mean, it's turning worldly power on its head. You know, Jesus rejected the devil's temptation in the in the desert, um, and we are called to follow Christ, who who you know God incarnate sacrificed Himself for us, and we are called to to do the same, take up our cross and follow. This is countercultural; it goes against uh, you know human instincts. It's hard; it's hard, but that is what we are called to do. What we have in Christian nationalism is embracing power and saying and baptizing it. Oh, no, no, no. We need power. We need all the power, the earthly powers. We need that to protect Christianity, which is destroying Christianity. I love what Rachel Den Hollander says. Actually, I quote this in, in my book. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not need your protection. Right? Jesus asks you simply to obey. And that means doing justice and telling the truth. That is it. But Christian nationalism says, no, the threats are so grave. And the threats change all the time. It was communism, and then it was secular humanism, and then it was radical Islam, and it's always the Democrats. And it's, you know, there's always a threat. It's the gay agenda. It's, um, you know, there's always a threat. And because the there's demon a threat, threats, Kristen, the, the demon, demon threats. Excuse me, yes. So you have to strike first. You've got to get them. You've got to take them out. You've got to grab the power before it's too late. That is not the way of Christ. I will say that, you know, as a Christian, uh, as a historian, I have to unfortunately talk about how Christians have actually acted, which is like often that's that's the case. So um, now we are in a moment where that rhetoric of you need to take power to do what is good. And we will tell you what is good. And it is this hierarchical order. And it is an agenda that aligns remarkably closely with the Republican agenda right now. And remarkably closely with MAGA politics, because that has become the Republican agenda. So what we have now is the rhetoric of Christianity and this sense of embattlement and sense of urgency that you have to act right now to save Christianity, to, to protect God. Even Trump will use that kind of language to play to this space. And you need to take all the power you can get. That's where we see the connection to this. I'll be a dictator for a day, for a day, right? Um, and I will, you know, I will protect you. And, and Christians, your problem, Trump tells them, you haven't used the power. You have so much more power. Then we look at a document like Project 2025, right? written by some people that are part of this network. 
uh, the, the author of the chapter on executive power, which recommends the seizure of unprecedented power across the executive branch and putting it in the hands of one person who they plan to be Donald Trump. The author of that chapter is Russ Vogt, and he is a self-proclaimed Christian nationalist, appears on stage with some of the guys in the film. Right, that's what we're talking about. And when you read Project 2025, they will say that the Constitution guarantees rights, sure, but not rights what we interpret them to mean and historically what they have meant, guarantees you the right to do what you ought to do, not what you want to do. Now, that language should set off alarm bells uh, because who defines what you ought to do? They do. It's this chain of command, hierarchy of authority. So for women, freedom in their system is submitting to the authorities uh, ahead of you, submitting to the men, right? This is how we get this extremist uh, uh, agenda. It makes all kinds of internal sense. So that's what I'm seeing when I have one eye on the politics, when I'm watching these networks, and when I'm actually listening to what they are advocating, to exactly what they are saying they are going to do if Trump wins again. They're going to grab as much power as they can, use it for their ends, which too many Christians are now conflating with their ends and with God's purposes. And I don't know how we step back from that because once that power is seized, it becomes incredibly difficult to get back. And so I am one of those who, because of the scholarship I've been doing, I have grave concerns about the future of our democracy because of exactly what I just spelled out. And that is on the ballot in 2024. Um, you know, we had... Um... We had a guest on a couple months ago who wrote a book um, aptly named Faithful Politics. Um, and she had said something that still sticks to me to this day where she's like, Christian nationalism is more about getting people to behave like Christians than to actually become Christians. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, totally. And it's and it's sad because as a believer myself, you know, I I I like to think that the gospel has a message that can help people navigate this crazy world we live in. Um, you know, we had a lot of medical issues with our oldest. I, I couldn't imagine going through that without having some sort of foundation of faith. And I, you know, I may not be out there passing out tracks or anything like that, but, but at mm -hmm. least like if, if people were to ask me, how, how did you get through that? I, I would, just say Jesus, not the, you know, not the storm, the capital Jesus, but like, you know, yeah. the, the deeply personal, <laughs> like, like Jesus that I've grown to, to love and care for. Um, and it just, it's just really, really sad that, you know, people are out there perverting it, but, um, anyways, um, yeah. And I, I would just tweak that, ahead. you know, uh, that idea of, you know, getting people to act like Christians instead of actually be Christians because uh, act like Christians in a very narrow sense and often twisted sense too. Right. Because, uh, you know, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, immigration policy, when we look at racial justice issues, when we look at, um, the equitable distribution of resources, when we look at creation care, you know, all of these things too, we're like, oh no, 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 no that's not what they mean. All right. So, you know, just a, a little asterisk there, but that certainly is how it is presented. Um, you know, that this is the Christian way to order your society. And yeah. if you're against any of, of our platform, well, you're against, you know, Christianity. So it, it, they thrive on this very stark us versus them. Uh, and it's Christians themselves who have to get in there and disrupt that and call that out. And they know that, which is why when you do um, expect your life to be miserable for a while <laughs> and like you got to have a thick skin if you're on social media because Christians themselves are the greatest threat to their success. Because it's Christians themselves that can pull back the veil and say, wait a minute, and draw on our theology and say, no, no, they're saying this, but it actually contradicts biblical teaching. And by advancing this, quote unquote, Christian agenda to make America a Christian nation, they're not just threatening the religious liberty of 
all Americans, um, Americans of all faiths and of no particular faith, they are threatening the religious liberty of Christians themselves because you cannot have an authentic Christian faith, or it's ex- extremely hard to, within this kind of a coercive system. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I was going to ask you um, at the top about, you know, if you're driving like a Lamborghini or like a Cybertruck, because I, I heard that you may be a shepherd for sale. Um, and, and, and if there's money there, I, I just want to just want to just to know if I can have a little, little bit of it, you know, mm, you know, uh, I, I like some say, money as well. Yes. I just want to make that known. I think, uh, it, it, let me tell you this. I think that survivors have made a whole lot less money. In fact, many of them have gone significantly into debt, uh, uh, to navigate their, these issues and to support their own advocacy. So they've made a lot less money than the author of that book, Attacking <laughs> Abuse Survivors. I will put that on record. And, uh, you know, in this film too, uh, is, uh, none of us who worked on it got paid. Our director, Carl Biker, put his heart and soul into this for a year drawing zero income. He's putting his own money. We're putting our own money into this project, intentionally putting it out on YouTube so that it's free and any person can access it at any time in the privacy of their own homes. Any women can access it. So we're really hoping that this does work its way inside those spaces. So I'd love to add one more little call to action that, you know, if you watch this film and if you think it's important to share it in your networks, and to even consider hosting a watch party, either virtually or in person. It's only a half an hour. It's designed for exactly that. Watch it with friends and then talk about it. And and how, how can people um, access the website? Like what? Give us some, some yep, details. Fourdaughtersfilm.com. Uh, you can go there. The The film also sits there, the trailer, um, and also information. So an email template so you can invite people to watch it, resources to connect people to, um, all sorts of uh, resources that we have, assets that you can look at and that can help you um, further explore these issues and also help you share this work. And we'd love to see it, you know, just getting further and further inside the spaces where it's most needed. That's awesome. Well, um, thank you so much, Kristen. It's really, really great just to get yes, a chance to talk you. with you again. Um, I still maintain you're a superwoman, so keep uh, <laughs> fight, fighting the good fight. Um, and uh, yeah, we definitely look forward to uh, having you back on when when you uh, save the world again. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love chatting with you guys and take care. All right. And to all of our listeners and viewers, thanks for stopping by. And as always, keep your conversations not right or left, but up. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Hey there, Josh Bertram here, faithful host of the Faithful Politics Podcast. I want to let you know about a compelling new spinoff, the Faith Roundtable, where I'll be interviewing top faith leaders, theologians, and scholars to unpack the pressing issues that are shaping the church in America today. We'll dive into topics like faith and public life, social justice, and how we can engage our communities more effectively. Make sure you don't miss any of our enlightening conversations by subscribing to it on our YouTube channel. Join me at the Faith Roundtable, where deep discussion meets thoughtful insight.